Since the beginning of time, humans have found ways to carry out conflict amongst themselves for political, cultural, and personal reasons. As years have gone by, the projectile weapons used in combat have developed from merely throwing rocks and shooting arrows to detonating bombs and launching missiles across oceans and continents. Throwing rocks is the most ancient and basic form of projectiles. They follow the same trajectory as all modern air and ground projectiles. Galileo discovered that all objects thrown follow the same curved path no matter what. A parabola. After the use of rocks as weapons, people began to realize that certain shapes covered more distance more accurately. Thus the arrow was invented. Evidence of the use of bows and arrows for war dates back to the Paleolithic era in northern Germany. The bow was such a powerful weapon that some empires, like the Roman and English, developed better ways to use it. Sometime during the era of the Romans, the crossbow was developed, bringing with it an increase in accuracy. The English developed the longbow in southern Wales, and it was their weapon of choice on the battlefield. Around 380, a scientist in China called Jie Hong wrote down the ingredients of gunpowder. He mixed sulfur, charcoal, and potassium nitrate. Originally, gunpowder was used for festive occasions to make fireworks. But during the Tang Dynasty, in 904 AD, inventors began to understand the great power behind gunpowder, and it gradually began to be used by the army with bamboo cannons and rockets. When it was first used as a weapon, the Chinese tried to keep it a secret from the adversaries in Western Asia and Europe. This plan failed, and shortly afterwards, the Muslims and Romans began to develop weapons with gunpowder in the 12th century AD. Cannons and rockets were widely used by the Mongols in the 13th century AD, and they spread these revolutionary weapons across Asia as they conquered. Gunpowder was also spread through the Silk Road, along with exotic spices and silks from East Asia to Europe. Gunpowder reached the hands of Roger Bacon, a monk in England. His experimentations with gunpowder sparked an effort by scientists in Europe to improve the use of gunpowder and invent new weapons that could benefit from this. The race to create the ultimate weapon began. New types of metal cannons with metal cannonballs, as opposed to stone previously used by the Chinese, were brought to existence shortly after gunpowder came to Europe and in the 1600s, individual gunpowder weapons were introduced. Although these huge, primitive weapons were very difficult to use, their noise and power were enough to promote them as the weapon of choice in the battlefield. No power could afford to fall behind in warfare technology, so the development of guns and explosives thrived. Early guns quickly became popular and brought about the introduction of more practical handheld weapons, such as percussion caps, rifled barrels, breech loaders, repeaters, and automatic weapons. Gunpowder was the most important aid to the innovation of projectile weapons. Because of its invention, we have been able to create the awesome projectiles we have today that cover our land, sea, and air. Projectile explosives are a means of causing maximum damage with the least amount of effort. They are used to help the average infantryman gain an advantage or give them a means of protecting themselves from more hostile threats, such as tanks, helicopters, and even heavy infantry. These weapons are used to gain a tactical advantage over the enemy. They allow the person to remain hidden and, with recent advancements, at a safe distance from their targets so that they may shoot them. Unfortunately, projectile explosives such as the rocket-propelled grenade, originally made by the Soviet Union, are used in terrorist attacks on planes, helicopters, and tanks alike. These versatile weapons are normally easy to carry and have a large kill radius. The grenade launcher is a weapon that has evolved very little over the years. At its conception, it was a very crude piece of machinery. It could be attached underneath the barrel, as you would see most often today in the U.S. infantry, or a grenade rifle in which the sole purpose of the rifle was to shoot a grenade. These two particular weapons were made to increase the range and accuracy of handheld grenades. With the introduction of this weaponry, soldiers are now able to shoot at larger targets and cause much more destruction from a longer and thus safer distance. These grenades are able to penetrate buildings and annihilate larger targets with much less effort and ammunition than before. More advanced and specified weapons soon followed these grenade launchers. Explosives were soon made to eliminate tanks and helicopters, two threats that were always out of reach and rarely taken down. These weapons were made to travel faster and more accurately than their predecessors. They were also more powerful. These weapons were made to penetrate heavy armor and eliminate large targets or threats quickly. They go through armor as if they were butter and explode, allowing for the major force of the explosion to damage the interior of the target or its occupants. This advancement has allowed infantrymen another advantage over heavily armored vehicles. It has also rewritten military strategy because now military advisors have to consider the possibility that the enemy will have weapons capable of destroying large targets. This long-range warfare has changed the way we look at war today. It has made it possible to separate yourself psychologically from a person or group of people you could be targeting from several hundred yards away.
The first concept of the torpedo dates back as far as 1775, when David Bushnell of Connecticut began the age of underwater explosive warfare, when he discovered that gunpowder could be detonated underwater. Robert Fulton continued off this discovery with the development of an underwater explosive. Although his ideas were not intended for wartime use, they were to be utilized to prevent war at sea by rendering the world's naval fleets obsolete. In 1797, Fulton first attempted to test and utilize the effectiveness of his underwater explosive during the French Revolution. The results of this explosive first use were not what they were intended for, but were rather intended to attack other ships as a rudimentary locomotive torpedo, thus beginning the age of underwater projectile explosives. One such example of the first use of the torpedo occurred during the Crimean War. Torpedoes were used for both defense and offense at Sebastopol at the entrance of the Sea of Azov in the Black Sea, at Kronstadt and Sweeborg in the Baltic Sea. The torpedoes proved to be very effective, although no ships were sunk but were seriously damaged. In 1866, after the Civil War, Robert Whitehead, the father of modern underwater weaponry, designed the first self-propelled torpedo. Whitehead's concept was imitated throughout the world. After designing the pointing tip on the torpedo, he developed two more models and began to sell them to interested navies. Torpedo development thrived as warfare was brought to a new battlefront. Within a short time, the British were manufacturing their own version of the Whitehead torpedo, which is known as the Woolrich, or Royal Laboratory, pattern. The French, German, Italian, Russian, and Chinese navies followed the Royal Navy in the purchase of the Whitehead torpedo, and soon Whitehead was exporting his torpedo around the world. By 1877, the Whitehead torpedo was attaining speeds of 18 miles per hour for ranges of 2,500 feet, 830 yards, and or 22 miles per hour for 600 feet, or 200 yards. The use of the torpedo by the U.S. Navy during World War I was negligible, a post-war and the pre-World War II era defined the modern torpedo. In 1920, the first American airdrop torpedo test was conducted with the MK-14, usually deployed from submarines. The MK-14 is responsible for sinking over 4 million tons of Japanese shipping during World War II. As hypothesized by Air Marshal Robert Sonby in his 1961 account of war, air bombing was what he called the third dimension of warfare. According to him, the art of war was previously a two-dimensional affair, but with the introduction of aerial combats, the limit to what is acceptable in war has been stretched. While it is true that total war has been a tactic used for centuries, it has now been redefined in its ability to quickly destroy entire populations without a need for foot soldiers to oversee the process. However, Sanbi argues that in modern warfare, aerial bombing of civilians is now acceptable, if not necessary, in order to end a war. He states that the limits of warfare are now free to be continuously stretched, with no end in sight. Take, for example, World War II, the largest war ever fought in terms of countries involved and number left dead. This war was the successor to the first war in which planes were involved, World War I, and already the amount of damage that aerial bombing was capable of was obvious. From fire bombings like that of Dresden in Germany, to the first and only two atomic bombs ever set off against humans, plane bombing was central to the way war was carried out in World War II. But aerial bombing is not simply limited to planes and their respective limitations. A new breed of missiles has come about, known as Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs. These missiles have a range of greater than 5,500 kilometers and require, in many cases, a nation with developed space exploration technology in order to successfully launch them. Because of the great expense of launching a missile of this magnitude, any warhead equipped must be highly effective, and thus the most common warheads are nuclear. The result of weapons with such deadly range and destructive force is global authority for the possessor of such technology. Aerial bombing makes warfare easier to carry out by those bombarding the targets. Well, you know, you just don't think about the, uh, about the guy on the ground very much, frankly. Um, the radar systems, the sensor systems I had on the aircraft that I flew, I was looking at it, an electronic signal. Basically the same thing as looking at an old uh, Pong game or something. The psychological impact of destroying a target versus shooting a person makes for an entirely different kind of warfare altogether. You're looking at a cube that represents a target. Conflict is objectified through bombings. This objective mindedness comes at the loss of realization as to what exactly the pulling of a trigger is doing to another human life. 